Good evening, and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news and trends from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and I'm joined this evening by Joel Fine from the Election Integrity Project, and we're here to talk about making sure that people's votes actually count. And uh, what got you into this, Joel? Is it, was, it, was it a passion since birth, or when did you start realizing that you wanted to be involved in making sure that the vote was true? Well, thanks for having me, Chris. Um, yeah, this is actually relatively recent for me. Uh, I'm a private citizen. I have been all my life, uh, not particularly involved in political activity or civics. Uh, but in November 2010, uh, I decided to get involved in, in various ways. One of the ways I got involved is I, I actually worked at the polls as an election officer. So for the day uh, in November 2010, I was technically an employee of the Registrar of Voters of, of Santa Clara County. Uh, it was a very interesting experience for me. I did it partially because I wanted to just be involved and be part of the, the electoral process, but also as a, as a learning experience. I came in with the perspective of, you know, this is, this is so important to our democracy to make sure that elections are run properly, that they're held in a fair, accountable, and honest way that I really want to personally learn about how it's done. And, you know, one of the perspectives I had was, you know, there, there are people out there who care so deeply about an election that they might be willing to do things that are uh, unfair, potentially even illegal, in order to sway the outcome of an election. If I were one of those people, what would I, what would I be thinking about doing? What are some of the opportunities I might have? And so when I went in to work at the polls, I went in with that perspective to think, okay, what, where are the weaknesses in the system? What kind of feedback could I give to the registrar or to anybody else to say, hey, here's how you might be able to fix this system. Here are some of the, the weak links that opens it up to potential for irregularities, fraud, whatever, and maybe in some way contribute to repairing those, those breaches. So it wasn't just a civic responsibility from making sure that the, the, vote, the voting uh, place had staff, but you were also looking at it analytically and, and from, a vo from a security perspective almost. So what did you see that day that you expected or didn't expect in that quest you were on to identify the holes? Well, some of my observations actually started before election day. The training that election officers receive is, is an interesting thing in and of itself. Election officers who work the polls get a total of, a, I think it's a three and a half hour training session to learn how to do what they're supposed to do for the day. And I consider that fairly minimal. It's a pretty complex job. Uh, there, most of the time things go smoothly and it's a routine kind of thing where you process voters in and out. But when things don't go smoothly, when there's some different, difficult situation to handle, let's say somebody comes in who for some reason is not listed on the rolls, but they insist that they're registered to vote. Uh, somebody comes in who needs assistance of some sort. They can't read the ballot or they're disabled in some way. Various kinds of situations like that where the routine gets disrupted and there are a lot of different cases that could confront an election officer on that day. And so for me the training was, was a fairly minimal introduction to how to be an election officer. Okay. So that was, that was the beginning of, of kind of I guess what, what I would say my, my learning experience as an election officer. And your concern. Absolutely, and, and my concern. It was fairly effective. It was a good use of the three, three and a half hours that I spent there. But as I said, it's, it's fairly minimal, and it's what's given to every election officer. And, you know, it's not like the people who, who are election officers do it for a full-time job. Right. You do it once every two years, you know, for primaries and for general election. And so it's easy for people to forget what it is they did. You know, most of the people there are private citizens just like me. They, they're, they don't have full-time gigs working for the registrar. Right. And so when they go back into the election, they have to remember all of this stuff. And, and so there's a lot to keep track of. So okay. that's, that's the start of it. Okay. And then when you actually got into the polling place, was there anything that you saw that concerned you further? Um, well, it, first of all, it's, it's a very long day. It starts at roughly 6 in the morning polls open at 7, and it goes until, I think we were working until about 10, 15, 10, 30 at night. The, the polls run from 7 to 8, 
but uh, that's sandwiched inside of a lot of other stuff that the poll workers have to do. Right. There's a lot of setup and tear down, um, and a lot of a lot of things that the poll workers need to do before and after to make sure that things run smoothly uh, all the way through the, the election day. Okay. And were there any anomalies or anything that kind of popped up that would have prompted you to move closer to going down this election integrity direction? It wasn't so much anomalies that I observed as opportunities for anomalies that really were impossible to figure out, impossible to ascertain whether, for example, it was, a, it was an honest election. Okay. In particular, uh, California is one of the states that doesn't require uh, ID at the polls. A voter can come in and give a name, and election officers aren't permitted to ask for ID to verify that that's the person who's speaking to them. Right. Um, and in fact, if the person were to show an ID, we're instructed to ask them to put it away and just verbally tell us their name or show us their election mailer to establish who they are. So we're not, pretty much we're not allowed to look at I identification. And, and that in itself is a concern for me because that opens things wide up. Anybody could come in and claim to be somebody on the, on the roster and we would just have to hand them a ballot. That's our legal obligation. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the, the example I kind of walk through in my mind is, you know, suppose I knew where, where somebody lives and votes. Mm -hmm. I could go in and vote on their behalf. That I happened. could just walk into the poll and yeah. say, I'm John Smith, I'm here to vote. Right. And there's no opportunity for the election officer to challenge that or to think about it or anything. It doesn't matter if I'm the same age as this John Smith I'm claiming to be. It doesn't matter if I look like John Smith. None of that matters. As long as I got there first before the real John Smith, I get his ballot. Right. And, I, and I've seen videos where people will go in posing as dead people or someone even went in recently posing as Eric Holder himself the head of the Department of Justice, and yeah. were able to be handed his ballot. They didn't take it uh, because they said, well, I don't feel comfortable without the ID, and then they scattered. But that kind of thing can definitely happen. Uh, Absolutely. And, it's, yeah, there are a number of states where, where voter ID is not required, and that's, that's a big exposure in those states. Right. And is it true that they actually put the list of people who hasn't voted yet outside the polling place in some uh, area, or is that some kind of... Yeah, in fact, that's, that's a... Part of California's election procedure is that every, at every precinct, three times on election day, and it's at specific times of the day, I think it's 11, 3, and 6. Uh, I could be a little off on those times, but three times during the day, the election officers are instructed to post a list of all of the voters in the precinct with the names of the people who have already voted that day crossed off of that list. And they post that somewhere that's publicly visible, publicly accessible. So anybody could walk up to that list, thumb through it, pick a name out of somebody that hasn't voted yet that day and turn around and say, that's who I am. Well, especially if they have a list of the voter rolls for some reason. Um, I know having run for office, you can buy lists of the voters in the area. And if somebody wanted to compare that list, it would be easy enough to say, well, I'm at XYZ address on Main Street, and I'm so-and-so, and off we go. And, uh, and my understanding is also that a lot of times the signatures that might be compared on the ballot to what's held at the registrar's office are not compared very closely either. Actually, I'm fairly confident that they're never compared. When you sign the, the roster uh, on entry to, to election, that's theoretically that would be a record that somebody could consult later to determine you know, validity or invalidity. So maybe after the fact, let's say I came in as this John Smith and voted, and I signed the roster in, in the, with the wrong name. <clears throat> if this other person came in and said, wait a minute, I haven't been here yet today, in the best case, he would be given a provisional ballot. Right. And Which are processed later. Right. But on the, and on that provisional ballot, it would describe the situation. Hey, this person came in. They were already marked off, but they claimed that they hadn't voted yet. And then the registrar would have to make a determination whether to count the ballot or not. In that situation, they probably would look at the election roster and then look at the signature and say, oh, that's not the right signature. Somebody else must have cast that ballot. So in the best case, that person's vote would count as a provisional, but the person who came in claiming to be John Smith, who wasn't, their ballot's already in that box. It's gone, and, it, and it's counted. So that's, that's water under the bridge. Right, which is pretty scary. So how did you start working with the Election Integrity Project? 
Well, so, so after this experience in November 2010, when I worked at the polls, I had this vague kind of unease. I felt like, gee, I wish there was something I could do. Um, I can tell that there are a lot of areas of concern, uh, opportunities for irregularities and even fraud, but I don't quite know what, what I can do. It was actually at a conservative forum meeting when uh, a lady named Nina Myers stood up and made an announcement. She made a pitch for people to participate. At the time, it was called Project Voter Integrity, I think. And she said she wanted people to participate with her in doing exactly that, to, to look at the electoral process, to work with the registrar, to work with the Secretary of State, whoever, uh, to expose these issues and to fix them. And because I was already inclined to participate in something like that, I, I went and talked with her. And, and so we formed a group with, with her and me and about half a dozen other people. As we went through what we were doing in Santa Clara County, over time we discovered that there were people in other counties in California who went through almost exactly the same thought process that we did in exactly the same way, in exactly the same time frame. Right, right about that election, November 2010, a lot of people became very passionate and very interested in either politics or electoral process or whatever. And so there were a lot of people in the same situation we were, where they felt like they wanted to do something <clears throat> and weren't quite sure what, and there was no group, no outlet to <laughs> channel that energy. And, and so we, we found each other somehow, I actually don't know how, and, and decided to get organized at a state level rather than just county by county. And, and so we connected with folks from LA County, Ventura County, San Diego County, <clears throat> Election Integrity Project, as it's now called, we're active in about, I think, 20 to 22 of California's 58 counties. And it's really the, the most populous ones that we're active in. So I don't know offhand, but I would guess we're, we're in about 80% of, the, of the, uh, the state's population. That's where EIP is, is active right now. Mm -hmm. so, so collectively, uh, we are spreading across the state working with our registrars of voters to, as I said, expose these, these areas of concern and fix them where we can. Have you found them to be very responsive yet? <coughs> to I'm hearing mixed results from the different groups that are working on this, that some registrars are very friendly toward them, others are saying thanks but no thanks. What's been your experience? Mixed response is exactly the right term. Uh, it depends very much on the individual registrar in any particular county. And, and it's not just their attitude, it's uh, the, the laws on the books and the procedures that are given to the registrars of voters offer all kinds of opportunities for interpretation. Different counties handle things in different ways. Everything from how they handle and process ballots to how they compare signatures on mailed ballots mm -hmm. to how they permit people to observe at the polls or during the counting process, how intimate they, they let us get in terms of uh, getting close to the people doing the work or giving us opportunities to give feedback if we see something that concerns us. Different counties have different policies about how to interact with us. And so you would think that a state would have a certain mandated, first of all, database, but also procedure <coughs> that would be consistent across the state. And what you're saying is that that's not necessarily the case. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's very different from one county to another in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, there is a California election law. And in fact, the California election law book is, is enormous. It's probably about 1,000 pages. But within that law, despite its, how voluminous it is, there's all kinds of different ways to interpret how exactly to proceed in any given situation, in any, any given election process. And, and so each registrar has latitude in designing their processes. So for example, when we want to, let's say, watch the people who are comparing signatures on mailed-in ballots, mm -hmm. one of the requirements that on a mailed-in ballot is that the voter signs the back of the envelope in which it's mailed. Right. And, and so there's a process by which every county compares one by one the, the signature on that envelope with the signature that's on record with the registrar's office. The process by which they do that comparison, the threshold for deciding whether it's a match or not in terms of similarity of signature, and even the proximity that they allow us in terms of watching and observing so that, for example, we could see the same thing that the person working at the computer sees and maybe 
have an opportunity to challenge, to say, wait a minute, we don't think that matched, but you counted it. That, just an example, but that's one of the ways where different counties are, interpret the law very differently. And um, I'm curious about, I, one of the things that I've heard that kind of irritates people is that within California, certain unions <coughs> have the contract for picking up the ballots from the the polling places and then if there's a recount or other scenario they have the ability to be the counters I've I've heard of even circumstances with them sitting at the table with erasers is that accurate or is that is that a county by county kind of scenario especially because this is one of the unions that I've that is very embedded and uh, also a very big donor to certain candidates over others did you find that to be uh, an accurate depiction of in your experience well so, so let's talk about kind of the, the principle of the matter which is our concern would be that if people who are working at the polls for the registrar have a bias in the election if they have a preference for an outcome and have the potential to act on that preference in their job in their responsibility then that's a concern and so yeah there there are people that, there are counties that that where I think most of the employees of the Registrar of Voters work for a particular union, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't have specific knowledge of, of that, so I, I, I don't know exactly which counties have which individual employees. But uh, again, the concern for us is that we want to make sure that everyone who's working at, at a Registrar's office on the election process have very high levels of integrity and, and don't uh, have, the, have a bias towards uh, pushing an election w in one direction or another. Right. And so are you able to share at a high level the types of, of things that you do or the types of volunteers that someone who's watching may decide, hey, yeah, I've got the same concerns Joel does. I'd like to get involved. Can you give us some descriptions of things that they might do to help out? The biggest thing is to help us observe at the polls. So one of the, one of the nice things about California law that does work in our favor is that it, it does require the, that citizens be given the opportunity to observe. Any registered voter in a county can walk into any polling station on election day and just watch. I wasn't and, aware and they, that that could they, happen. And they can watch almost anything. There are, there are limits on what they can do. They can't, for example, take photographs. They can't use their cell phones in the, in the polling station. They can't walk out of the room with the, the list of voters. They can't sit behind the table where the election officers are. And they, of course, they can't interfere with anybody voting. But other than that, they can do just about anything. So we can you know, stand in the corner and, and watch people come in. We can listen in as they say, you know, here's who I am, I'm ready, ready to vote. A again, as long as we don't interfere, we're permitted to be there. We can be there as long as we want. Uh, and uh, when we... And that's what we did, in fact, in, in the past couple of elections, is we, we posted observers in various polling stations and asked them to make, uh, to make observations for us. Mm -hmm. We gave them some training in terms of what we wanted them to look for and what were some of the procedures that we were concerned about, uh, some of the requirements, some of the, some of the, uh, the things that election officers are supposed to do that we were concerned maybe they weren't always doing. Right. And, and so our biggest need is for volunteers to do that. We have about 2,000 polling locations in Santa Clara County alone. Mm -hmm. uh, Alameda County is probably pretty similar, and other counties in the area might vary from that. But uh, with that number of polling stations, we can take an almost unlimited number of observers. We would love to have one or two people all the way through Election Day at every polling station. Sure. But that would take an enormous army. Right. The more we can get, the better. Right. And so, just out of curiosity, I know in Alameda County, about 70% of the, mm -hmm. the voters vote by mail. And there are a lot of places that have no polling stations, so their only opportunity to vote is by mail, mm -hmm. which opens up a whole other set of circumstances where fraud could occur. Absolutely. Uh, is that a similar ratio, what you're seeing in, in Santa Clara County, about 70% mail? What I've seen in Santa Clara County is about 50%. Okay. R roughly, um, but I know that I, most registrars are in favor of mail ballots. Yes, they encourage people to sign up to be permanent absentee voters so right. that they always get a mailed ballot. Right. Uh, 
uh, I think mostly it's because it's it's cheaper and easier for them. Right. If they can get down to the point where they're less than, I think the threshold is 250 in-person voters in a precinct, they can shut the precinct down and force everybody to go mail only. Yeah. And and as I said, it's it's easier and cheaper for them, so that's what they like to do. Right. So in fact, if you go and vote in person, very often you'll be presented with a with an opportunity that the, the people working there will say, "Hey, would would you like to sign up to be a permanent absentee voter?" Right. And and so, and and that's a concern for us as well. Is mail ballots are handled very differently than in person ballots. Right. And as you mentioned, there's a bunch of opportunities for, for irregularities and, and even fraud in that regard. I just would have a nightmare scenario of seeing people sitting in a warehouse that's darkly lit uh, with <laughs> just filling them out one after another and nobody would be the wiser necessarily. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the issue is that, that ballots have intrinsic value. This is something that, that the registrar in Santa Clara County, Barry Garner, shared with me. He said he, he treats them like money. In As the sense they should. That, in the sense they have to be protected. There has to be a chain of custody yes. so that you know step by step who who has the ballot, who has control of the ballot, right. and that the ballot's being handled properly. Mm -hmm. With ballots that are sent through the mail, you lose that chain of custody. Yes. It goes into somebody's mailbox. Maybe that person picks it up. Maybe a spouse picks it up. Maybe a neighbor picks it up. Maybe it's at an apartment complex. Mm -hmm. And every all the mail is pooled together. Right. Who knows? Uh, when it When a person receives the ballot, I know I personally took my ballot, I get a mail ballot, and I put it on my counter. And I have to admit, it was probably pretty careless of me, but it's possible that you know, I might have had a guest come over and see that, that envelope and do something with it. Right. And, and so, just in general, people you know, aren't necessarily careful with their ballots that yes. are mailed to them. Right. And in the same way that they, they would be if they were at the polling station. Right. And so we've got just a few seconds left. If someone's moved to help, where can they find out more? So we've got a website. It's it's a mouthful. It's electionintegrityproject.com. Okay. So it's the it's the full name of the organization, electionintegrityproject.com. And on that website, there are opportunities to sign up to be a, be a volunteer, and you would say on that which county you want to participate in. And there's also a donate button. We'd love to get donations to help defray expenses. Okay. We're an all-volunteer group. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time and for the knowledge that you've shared. It's uh, been enlightening for me, and I'm sure it will be for the audience as well. Thank you very we much. Appreciate Chris. it, Joel. So hang tight while we have a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum.
we'd like to thank our sponsor once again, the Conservative Forum, for making the right side possible. The Conservative Forum works hard to educate people about conservative issues and bring in great speakers from around the country. For example, July's speaker was just flown in from Colorado, uh, Tom Tancredo, to do the presentation at the July Forum. On August 7th, Jack Cashel will be speaking. On September 11th, which is the second Tuesday of the month, n the month normally the forum takes place on the first Tuesday of the month. Uh, John Fund will be speaking then on October 2nd. It's Jesse Lee Peterson. On November 6th, it'll be an election watching party. And on December 4th, Christmas dinner. And there's always entertainment and other things provided there as well. In closing this evening, we talked about during the show how important it is to maintain the integrity of the electoral process. One of the concerns that we have is that on a federal level, there are, there are pieces that are being blocked and states are not necessarily being allowed to follow the law in the way that they think is best to preserve the integrity of the vote. We've had situations where the Department of Justice is bringing suit against states who are asking for ID, which Joel mentioned earlier as being critical to making sure that the right person is providing the vote and that their vote is counted. We've had scenarios where the Department of Justice has refused to prosecute individuals who are intimidating voters and chasing them away from the polling places or threatening them with a potential physical harm by uh, slapping batons in their hands. These things are not acceptable. And so if you have the opportunity and the passion to make sure that every vote is counted and that it's done correctly and ethically, please do consider volunteering for the Election Integrity Project at electionintegrityproject.com or looking for other ways to volunteer locally and get educated about the possibilities for fraud and how you might be able to help stop them and make everyone's vote count. Thanks again for joining us on The Right Side. Again, I'm your host, Chris Pereja, and we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Have a great night.